I give you a very warm welcome to Grace Community Church's Sunday evening service. You've joined us on the third of a series of four where we're interviewing people who we've been in touch with, who can come and encourage us and help us as Christian believers. Uh, tonight's special guest is a friend of mine, Graham Daniels, known universally as Dano. Uh, he is the head of Christians in Sport. He's the director of that. He's still very committed and involved in sport as a director of Cambridge United Football Club, and he was formerly a professional footballer himself. Uh, Dano is uh, an encourager, he's an inspirer, he's a challenger. He's someone you think he could talk to my friends quite easily. Uh, he will help you too to learn how to share your faith more naturally. I'm really delighted that Graham is with us tonight. Uh, my daughter Caroline is going to interview him. Uh, Kaz has worked for many years with Christians in Sport and knows Dano well. So we're looking forward to that interview. That's coming up in a few moments time. But why don't we just commit ourselves to God first in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are the God of the whole world. And you're the God that says, take my good news to everyone. Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have people in all walks of life, all situations in society. And we thank you that tonight we can hear from someone who's been encouraging Christian sports people to live life with integrity and witness boldly for Jesus, all built on a life of being friends to and prayerful for those they meet. We pray that all of us, whether we're sporty or not, will find this evening's meeting a huge encouragement to us. We commit it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Kaz and Dano. Hi Dano, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, now I know you, um, I've known you for quite a while actually, through Christians in Sport, um, so you're called Graham but known by a lot of people as Dano. And um, so for those that maybe don't know you like I do, um, find out a little bit about you. So you're based in Cambridge? Yes, based in Cambridge. Um, lived here quite a long time really. Uh, since 1983 um, so uh, yeah moved here to play football actually uh, back then and got married a few months after getting here so my three children have grown up in Cambridge and grandchildren now uh, so it's been home for a long time but as you can tell Cass uh, the Welsh heritage doesn't disappear that easily Lovely. And so you're married to the lovely Michelle and you've got three older children. How many grandchildren have you got? Uh, four. 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 Four grandchildren. I, 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 I say four because uh, as we're recording, the fourth one was only born a couple of days ago. So oh. I just had to recalibrate and say it's four. <laughs> Congratulations. That's lovely. Oh, so um, obviously I said I know you through Christians in Sport. That's a big part of what you do. Um, you're at St Andrew's the Great Church, St Andrew the Great Church, um, and very much involved in Cambridge United. So um, it's lovely to have the chance to chat to you and talk through kind of how all those different factors link into life and faith and um, and all the other things that come with it. So looking forward to having a chat with you and um, let's start with Christians in Sport so um, as I say I, I've known you for a while through Christians in Sport and you're actually director of Christians in Sport what, what does that mean? Christians in Sport exists to reach the world of competitive and elite sport for Christ so so maybe worth saying that it means two things and it, there's one thing it doesn't mean so playing games and sport it doesn't mean that we try and encourage people to go to the odd badminton evening or football kick around uh, once a month to try and get to know people. That's a marvelous thing. It's an absolutely marvelous thing to engage in community. Mm -hmm. But we're less, less invested in trying to get people to do sport for fun, for recreation. And we, what we are is committed to, well, Kaz, obviously you're a great example of it, people who are very competitive about their sport. They've got a job, they've, they go to school as a youngster, they're at college, they've got a job across the ages, but they're part of a group of people where you train and play. So it's the Christian engaging in a community, which is a, quite a committed community. So we help those guys 
And then there's a few people who are paid to play sport and, and play at an elite level. And we pay particular attention to people like that. So it's making sure that the world of sport has two things going on in it, in competitive and elite sport. That people who don't know Jesus, the message of Jesus, get to hear it, evangelism. And those who are Christians of all ages in sport get encouraged that God can use them in that community. So yeah. reaching the world of sport for Christ. Fantastic. I know um, I got involved when I was at university and the biggest thing that stayed with me the whole time is the pray, play, say little kind mm. of acronym Perfect. and just a reminder that actually, yeah, I need to pray for my sports mates, play in a way that honours God and shows them something about the faith I have and say something when I have that opportunity. And, yeah. you know, I guess whether you're in sport or not, actually, that, that same little, you know, little piece is so important. Yes, and of course it wasn't, well, two things. One, you said it much more succinctly than I did because I waffled and you were bang on, pray, play, say. And secondly, as, it, as everything with Christians in sport, all my best, all my best uh, learnings were gleaned from my local church and particularly 20 years at St. Andrew the Great or Stag, where initially I, I worked under Mark Ashton, who was a tremendous mentor to me when I started with Christians in Sport when I was 38, uh, and impressed on me the real importance of, of the local church. Uh, and so the pray, play, say does come out of what I learned at Stag originally, really. And you're right, Kaz, it, it travels everywhere. We take it from Colossians 4, 2 to 6. Uh, so it's Paul really drawing to a conclusion, his letter to Colossae. And in it, as he talks about life and family and work and uh, everything to do with being a Christian, he reminds them in that passage in chapter four, that if you don't combine praying, if you, if you don't talk to God about the social situation you're in, you're missing something pretty significant. Mm -hmm. If you talk to God, it gives you insight from his word that you feed back in conversation with him to play. I call it play, but in everyday life, it's behavior, isn't it? It's yeah. how you live. What does it look like to be a Christian woman at school or at home or at work or at sport? Pray, play or live or behave and say. Uh, very hard to get the chance to say something of the good news of Jesus if people don't see it backed up by at least some degree of integrity. Mm. Uh, and, and very hard to sustain that lifestyle if you don't hear God's word and speak back to him. So pray yeah, place yeah. is something lovely, really. Yeah, absolutely. And you talked about Christians in sport, um, you know, predominantly supporting elite sports players. Um, and very recently you've been on Sky Sports kind of talking all about that. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, it, it's the lockdown period, isn't it? That's, I guess that's why we're having this conversation as we are now. It's, it's a very weird and frustrating time. Uh, and the positive is, you know, the Lord's got it and he's, uh, he's in charge of the whole thing. And what happened uh, was that when the lockdown came, <laughs> people like Talk Sport and Sky and the BBC and so on didn't have as much actual sport to report. <laughs> so they were looking for features in sport that brought a different angle because they just didn't have enough features. And so we did quite a lot of stuff on mental health. So it's easy for the secular media, I think, to talk to a, not easy for them to talk to a Christian organization, mm. but they felt able to do it because we were speaking into perhaps a spirit of the age or, you know, an issue of the age, which is talked about freely in sport, which is mental health. So that was the entry point for a number of conversations how does of course they call it faith in the secular media how does faith have anything to say or invest in good mental health for sports people so that was the opening that was the open door for conversations that we walked through yeah fantastic and um you know can you unpack a little bit about what you what you talked about how does faith interact with mental health and, and sport if you're an elite sports person, you're a five-year-old boy or girl growing up in Bedford, then you're the best at sport, a particular sport in your class by the time you're six or seven. And by the time you're nine or 10, you're the best in the school and you're one of the best in the town. 
And by the time you're 15, you're in the England school setup, and everybody in Bedford knows you as the child from the local paper who's the, the, the sporty girl. Well, of course, that's who you are. So by the time you're 18 or 19, now let's turn into a boy. You're, you're a boy and you play for Spurs in football or you play netball for England as a girl. At this point in your life, all you've ever known is that whenever people talk about you, they talk about this, not about you, but about this athlete. So you're an athlete, but guess what? When you get dropped by Spurs, or when you don't play for England anymore, and you walk through Bedford and people say, oh, how's it going with England? And you say, oh, it's okay. Thank you very much. I haven't seen you playing in the first team recently at Spurs. I yeah, a bit of an injury. And, and your identity is, you're, you don't know who you are anymore. Mm. The Christian faith wants to say all the time, and this is what I would say in the secular media, it's a wonderful thing to be an athlete. It's amazing to be an elite athlete. But make no mistake, mm. there is a God who gave you the talent to play. And if you depend for your identity and meaning and purpose in life on your role, that everybody judges you by, particularly in sport, it's gonna end up in tears because we're more than the way we present ourselves in society. We're children of God and we need to have a relationship with him. And I guess as you're working with elite sports people then, how does it differ between helping those that are Christians and mm. those that maybe aren't Christians with what you've just said about you know, that pressure of being an elite performer but having your, you know, where your identity is? So you know that you can't persuade somebody to be a Christian. God has to do that. So I think I'd have to say that I'm always make sure that I explain the Christian message as appropriately as possible in the context of the player or manager or coach I'm talking with mm. in the context of their language. But secondly, there's something that is universal here. So, um, It's, it's inbred in us. I think it's instinctive in us because we've turned our backs on God to cut deals with God. So let me tell you a story of, of a world champion athlete who I met. I shan't say where, but it was, a, it was a major event, a world championship type event. And a young man who was a Christian came to the Bible study on the first day. He'd never left his country before. Uh, and he'd never run in the world championships before. And he came to the event and he asked to see me afterwards, and it was a Bible study, maybe 20 or 30 athletes in this uh, overseas city. I'd never met him. And he said, I can't sleep at night. I've been here in four days and I can't sleep. I said, well, hmm, perhaps it's jet lag. You've never left your country before. And he said, no, no. He said, I keep thinking, what if I don't win? And it's the world championships, athletics. <laughs> I said, well, have you, have you ever lost before? He said, I've never lost. He's 21, he'd never lost a race in his whole life. Mm -hmm. In his whole life. Now, here's the, here's the thing, yeah. and I bet people will get this. For the first time in his life, he's against people who he think can beat him. And then he, he's a Christian, and then he says, mm -hmm. I'm saying to God, if I win, I'll tell the whole world about you. When I get my gold medal and do the media afterwards, I'll tell them, I'll point to Jesus. So that's a long way round and you wonder where I've gone to saying, how do I talk to athletes? How do you encourage people to talk to athletes? Mm -hmm. You get them to say to them if they're a Christian or not, you can't cut the deal with God. He doesn't need you to win. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need you to get a first in your degree. He doesn't need you to be the best salesman in your company. Go for it work for it but hear this loud and clear he loved you when you hated him and he existed and made the universe before you were born so he really doesn't need you to cut a deal with him to love you mm. and i said to him if you lose that race in fact if you lose the qualifiers and you're last his evangelism will go on and his mm. love for you will be undiminished if you win guess what his evangelism is gone and his love is undiminished and most of the time, I find in sport, the higher you go, you have to say that 500 times to every one time it falls into place. It's free. 
The mm. gospel is free grace. Stop cutting deals. Stop trying to earn the right to get mm. God's favor. Yeah, because I, I guess as a, an elite performer, you're so used to having to, you know, meet certain standards, train, and you know, everything is t targeted to that one thing, isn't it? And I guess you then end up having that kind of mentality with faith as well and with God. Yeah, That's but, interesting. You, you do, but, but let me just turn one end of it, split, split it round again. Here's what happens. I mean, I've got a hundred variations, so you'll have to watch it. Somebody loses a big race. It really doesn't matter if they've been a Christian 10 years sometimes, and, and even in a really good Bible teaching church. The default position when you lose, the default position, if you think you're going to win, or if you think you're going to finish third, you finish fifth, whatever, You've worked for it, you spend two years or a year, six months working for this event. You think you can win, let's say. You finish second. You grieve. First thing is you grieve. Every athlete knows this. You lose, it hurts. But it hurts. Next thing is, why did God not let me win? I've had that 5,000 times mm -hmm. with quite mature people. Because it's the mm. question, why did God? Why did God is the default human position. Mm. Why did God? And you have to say to a person then, at that point, you have to say, why do you think? And time and time again, somebody say, well, I know why it was. The game is on Saturday. On Wednesday, I did a really bad thing. I watched something or I said something about somebody or I gossiped and I... Mm. And you say, well, so you think you came third because you said a bad word about somebody on Thursday. Yeah, I reckon. I'm not doing that again before a race. Say, so, so you see what you just did? You just negotiated with God. Yeah. So before the race, you negotiate. I'll, if, if I win, I'll give you glory. And when you lose, you say, oh, it must be because I sinned. And then you have to say the opposite. You say, you sin all the time, you fool. That's why you've got a savior. Don't be ridiculous that you lost because you did X on Thursday. That is absurd. Mm -hmm. It's like saying you cut deals with God. You have to go around this circle all the time. Stop mm -hmm. thinking that God loves you because you cut a deal to perform for him. You're mm -hmm. not your performance. You're loved. Mm -hmm. That gospel message, the more public people are and the more people see them as their success or failure, the more intense that becomes including the job in a school or an office or as a parent if your parents fail what did i do wrong what what your child's not converted what did you do wrong it must be my fault why did i do it wrong and parents grieve they never talk about their children if they're not converted why because they're ashamed why are they ashamed because they think it's their fault why do they think it's their fault because they think somehow they didn't do a deal with god enough they don't understand grace a thousand applications of it so, so mm. I'll leave it with that one. Yeah, no, very helpful. And I guess over lockdown, you've actually had a lot more contact with more um, with elite performers. I've been in some of the kind of prayer meetings about it, and there's been some real encouragements. Can you tell us about some of the some of the encouragements over lockdown with? Bible oh well, well, I I suppose many people have been through this. S certainly, we know, don't we? And I know, uh, I'm sure at Grace Church, you've had more people coming to church who are inquiring about the Christian faith online than ever so it's all weird we don't know what to do with it well in sport uh, with professional sport it was ridiculous you know to get to let's pick uh football football let's do it's my sport to get to to meet a footballer to meet the manager of a football club in the north of england your phone your whatsapp you, you maybe have the odd you'd never have a zoom you know you have a facetime call but you jump on the train and then try and meet him at the training ground and snatch an hour to have a coffee together and look at the Bible. If he's not in a church, introduce him to a good church where he can get to meet some. <laughs> All of a sudden in lockdown, nobody can go to work. They can't go to their training ground. They can't go to their office. They can't see players. They can't. Guess what? We went from seeing like four people a week or something, eight people a week with just jumping in the car and we went to having 40 or 50 people in football in the room in three weeks because we did a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And guess what? People invited their friends from football to come. And all of a sudden, you've got all these people in a call and you put them in breakout groups of four. And people find out somebody's either interested in Jesus 
always met Jesus, who they knew from football, but they didn't know he had any interest in the gospel. Mm. Boom, off it went. And now, of course, it was peer friendship. So 10 minutes Bible study at the start, 15. Breakout groups for 30 minutes in fours. Feedback. Stay on in a, in a spare room if you want to hang around and chat to people. Ah, so it's, okay. it's, it's happened in all the sports. So yeah. it's been a revolution. I don't quite know what we're going to do with it. And, and I guess, yeah, it's great to hear encouragement, isn't it, of lockdown? Because it has, it's so tough in so many ways. But that's just an example of a, a real opportunity that's just really gone. Um, and in terms of you personally, you're, you're director of um, Cambridge United. Yeah. It, what does the work there look like? How has that been kind of before lockdown, during lockdown? Um, because I used to play for the team, I suppose, I have a good relationship with the coaching staff. Um, mm. And it's just a privilege, really. Obviously, it's not a, it's not a Christian organisation. It's a football club. Mm. So I guess, Kaz, as, as, as you know very well, from your professional life to your sports life and your church life, it's a marvellous opportunity to engage with people who may never have been near a church in this mm. generation, but they get to work with somebody who, who knows that God's real and has met Christ personally, but is engaged and invested in sharing that football club together, which I guess takes us back to the Christians in sport thing, isn't it? It's, it's getting Christians particularly to get stuck in to institutions, established institutions like sports clubs, where you can really share the gospel and life with people who love the same sport as you, gifted by God to it, that you might share Christ, pray, play safe with them. Mm -hmm. So Cambridge United for me is a wonderful place. I spent most of my life there and I'm a pray, play sayer. I guess the Cambridge United side of things is more from a professional working point of view and that would be like a similar challenge to me as a teacher, how I kind of do my job and, and try and use as opportunity to talk to people. But from a sport point of view, are you playing sport now? What are the kind of challenges and opportunities that come with that? Um, Hmm. Well, uh, as, as with most ex-pros, I've had about 12 operations on my knees and hips and ankles. <laughs> so uh, uh, walking's my best sport because uh, everything else is creaking to the point do of... Do they great. do walking football now? They do, don't they? They do, but listen, I'm waiting till I'm at least 60 to start that. <laughs> not that far away, but I'm not doing that yet. Uh, uh, no, so... Um, no, my, really, my investment is, I suppose, more in a coaching and mentoring side of, of, of our staff on the football side. So they're all, of course, the management staff are in their 30s and 40s. I don't relate to the players directly because that's not my role. But I, I try to invest my energy and time, I suppose, as an older guy at the club in supporting the coaching staff. That's the joy I get from it. Mm -hmm. Not tactically not in how to run their teams because they're experts at it. But I suppose in terms of life, you know, when the pressure, the pressure comes on them, even with a crowd of four or 5,000 watching you with social media, that's very quickly 30 or 40,000 people commenting. And if you're the coach and you lose, then sadly, as with everything in modern society, in terms of social media, 99% of it is, uh, is abuse and stick. So actually, of course, we're back to where we've been. You're saying to somebody who's the coach of a football club, uh, hey, how's your mum and dad? Or how's your wife? Or uh, how's their new house move going? And Have you had a day off recently? Mm. You're treating them as human beings and not interacting with them transactionally just because they're a coach of your team. So I think you've got to model that as a director and point to the fact that you're more than a coach. Mm. And in that, obviously, you hope that the coaching staff get a chance to hear something of Christ. Yeah, and that's why, lovely. why he's the doorway, you know, why he is the doorway to a bigger picture. But, but sorry to come back on that, Kaz, but a bigger picture. And I think I've segued a bit here, but I think it's quite important. You know, nobody would ever say to you as a Christian woman, well done for going to, for training to be a teacher so that you can share the gospel. You'd say, well, no, I think you've got that a bit wrong. I love teaching. I'm a teacher. I just happen to be somebody who's also a Christian and a teacher. So I pray, play, say, 
at school, but mm. didn't go to teach just so I could do evangelism. Mm. And it's very easy sometimes when we think of sport at competitive and elite level to say, oh, well done you for sticking in sport to make sure people hear the gospel. People will see through that in five minutes in sport. It's inauthentic. Mm. And I think that's really important if people are wired up for music or the arts and so on. It's who they are. It's who they were made. And they should pray, play, say that it's not a means to an end. So mm. I must never talk about Cambridge United as a means to an end. Mm. It's mm. who I am. It's where God mm. put me. It's my vocation. And I should live out my Christian discipleship in that area as everybody else should, right? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Janet. And, and what about you? How did you come to be a Christian yourself? Oh, well, well, just the most marvellous, at least two people, you know, because stories have legs, don't they? But two people have made a huge difference in my life. My mum, I mean, my dad and mum were wonderful. My dad wasn't converted. Uh, traditional church, Welsh church, chapel background non-conformist background. So we all went to church, 60s, 70s. Um, but my mum was a believer. Um, you know, wouldn't have been, lots of things would have been fuzzy in the way the Bible was taught in that culture at that time, but definitely knew Christ personally. But dad did before he died. So she mm. prayed for me. Um, what stands out would be, is, uh, I stopped, go I wouldn't go to church after I was about 13. I refused to go. And, uh, Sunday wasn't a happy day. And on Sunday night at eight o'clock, there was hymn singing on the radio, local radio in Welsh. And it was a supper time. And my mum would never make supper till half past eight after the hymn singing. So I used to say, oh, come on, mum, make some supper. She'd say, listen, listen to this hymn. One day you'll sing that hymn yourself. You'll sing that hymn and you'll want to one day. And I was converted before she died, so it was great. So my mum prayed for me. And then um, when I was 15, I was chosen for my school cricket team because a boy was dropped out five minutes before the bus left school. Um, I thought I was picked because I was good, but I wasn't. I was picked because a boy was sick. I jumped on the bus, uh, went on a 50 mile journey to Cardiff and back from, uh, from Llanelli. And the captain, I was in year 11, and the captain was, uh, I was in year 10, so I was young. So I didn't know anyone, but I'd lived, it was easy to get my kit and stuff. Captain was really good. He was in the upper sixth. So he sat by me because I didn't know anyone and kept me company. I didn't do anything at the game. Fielded third man, didn't bat, which means if you don't know cricket, I did nothing. Um, and he scored loads of runs and took loads of wickets. And on the way back, uh, on the way out of Cardiff, five miles out, 45 to go, he said, um, what did you do? It was Monday. What did you do at the weekend? I said, I played cricket Saturday. And on Sunday, I didn't do anything because it was bored because there's nothing on on Sundays in the 70s. I said, what did you do? He said, I played cricket Saturday. I went to church Sunday. I said, you went to church? 18 years of age. Top sportsman at school. And my face must have given away that I couldn't understand. And he said, is that surprising? And I said, well, why do you go to church? And he said, because I follow Jesus. He said, oh, because I follow Jesus. And then he flushed up a bit with color, a bit embarrassed. Uh, I can't quite remember, but I think I withdrew because all I can remember thinking is 45 miles to go, I'm trapped. <laughs> but because I was 15, I, was, I met Jesus personally. I gave my life to Christ at 21. And I moved from Wales to Cambridge to play because it was an ambition to be a footballer. and. I'd finished studies and I was able to start being full time, mm -hmm. but it was a you know it was an empty dream. It it wasn't fulfilling, and that's why I became a Christian because this boy had known him from fifteen, and he was just the most marvelous guy. He had his failures. I remember him throwing his bat once when he lost the cricket and he didn't see me. He came in the changing room, threw his bat out of shock. So I didn't think he ever did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And I went wow. And so I really admired him. And when my identity was wrapped up with football uh, and I got what I wanted, which was to be a pro, all I could think of was this guy. Mm. At peace, secure, knew who he was, and I turned to Christ. And the, the last bit of the story is I asked him some years later about that day where we were on the bus. And he said, 
He said, well, guess what happened when I went home that night? I said, I don't know. He said, well, I went home, my dad and mum were in the living room and they said, how was the cricket? And he obviously played well. And uh, he said, yeah, it was good. How many did you score? And, and his father said, well, you don't look very happy. If you played that well, you must be, you should be a bit happier than that. And he said, I told my dad, well, there was a boy on the bus, so I didn't know who was picked because we were short of players. And uh, he asked me, I tried to tell him about Jesus because he had resolved that week that he would try and tell somebody about the gospel because he never had. Yeah. And it was me. And his dad said, well, what's the problem? He said, I really, really blew it. I was useless. Mm. So I'm 58. I'm talking to you about mm. things. And I'm here, humanly speaking, because my mother prayed for me and was losing heart a bit. Mm. And a boy who could barely string an evangelistic five words together, let alone a discussion, mm. dared to tell me with blushing face that he followed Jesus. And, and God used that to change my life because I didn't think it was possible that anyone who was sporty, my mum could be a Christian, but not anyone sporty and cool and young in Wales mm. in the 70s. And he was the one for me. So I don't know why that boy was sick that day or who he was or why he didn't play. Mm. All I know is the gospel advances because people pray and they play. Mm. And he said, haltering, stuttering, blushing words which made him so embarrassed that later that night he was pig sick when he went home amazing. it's amazing so I, guess, I guess you probably kind of answered it really but i was going to ask if um you know someone that was listening is a christian but struggling what would you say to them as kind of a half-time talk um to encourage them or oh, i'd say we're all very good at putting up a front you know i changed my t-shirt to put a collar on to talk to you, Cass, you know, because I'm in the house and it's boiling hot. It's a baking day <laughs> and I look like a complete scruff, more of a scruff than I do now. So we, we can all put the, you know, it's, it's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with presenting yourself well. It's, it's right to, to present yourself as best you can, to be respectful of people. But if somebody's feeling they're having a rough time and they're no good at this, being a Christian, I'd want to say, listen, take our nice shirts off and we're all ruins. You know, take our nice shirt off and we're, we're fractured and broken people. The Lord Jesus loves you, not because you're any good at anything today or you've done had a brilliant week. He loves you because he sent his son to die for you. That's all you need to know. Now believe it. But just believe it. That, for me, it seems always you have to do that. It's, it's the faith that says, I, I've said, a, look, I, I'm full of cliches, because I've said so many thousands of times, to somebody you can't quite believe can you that jesus loves you you can't quite believe it can you not quite you nearly can can't you you nearly can but you blew it this morning so he can't quite can he can't quite he can't quite love you he does love you it doesn't depend on your own performance mm. it's free so i'm not saying that to anyone else for their half time I'm saying it to myself mm. saying it to myself i believe it stop not quite believing it Mm. I have to say it every day a thousand times. Say the same yourself. Mm. I'd say because it's mm. true. Yeah, absolutely. And if if someone was listening that's not yet a Christian, what would you say to them with your experience of four people knowing the Bible, Jesus? What? Well, I, I'd say just stop. I, it, I I've often talked to men, obviously men, not boys. That so I say, man, stop, will you? Stop stop right there right stop breathe in look up somebody made you somebody made you they knew the moment you were born they know the moment you'll die they give you life and breath right now you get life and breath because of him now think clearly if you've turned your back on him if you're ignoring him and saying Fine, you might be there, but it's my life. Listen really clearly. He'll honor that when you die. He will honor your rejection of him. He made you a responsible person. If you respond by turning away, you'll meet him and he'll honor your rejection and you will live forever. The Bible says you live forever. You will live apart from him 
and everything that's wonderful in this world would be taken away. The Bible calls it hell. It means that everything wonderful is taken. But you chose not to take it. You turned away. So the first thing I'd say of two to you, if you're thinking about these things, there really is a God. He really is powerful. You really will stand before him. Stop walking away from him. Turn around. Turn around and look. And if you'll turn around with me now and look, you know what you'll see? Go on physically. Turn your head. Go on. Do you know what you'll see? You'll see God's son on a cross because he dies on that cross. God pays the penalty for you turning your back on him. He paid the price himself on a cross. Jesus Christ is God's son who died to take the punishment you and I deserve for rebelling against our creator who gave us everything. So finally, what is a Christian? A Christian is somebody who looks at Christ and says, thank you, you've paid for me. My rebellion is done. The cost is on your shoulders. I can walk into God's presence. Mm -hmm. And then I'd look at my friend and I'd say, mate, you're free now. You are free. You are free. You need to believe every day of your life that God really does love you through Christ and he can never undo the deal. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'd say is, my friend was called Guion Jenkins. And when I gave my life to Christ when I was 21, I went back to Fnethi and saw him the first summer after becoming a Christian. I'd phoned him up and I gave my life to Christ in Easter 84. And uh, phoned him up. I said, Guion, Graham Daniels here. He said, oh, hello. I said, hello. I said, hey, good news. I've become a Christian. And he went, good. Because he didn't quite know if I knew what a Christian was. Or whether you know, I, somebody had told me something wrong or not true. <laughs> so when I actually saw him face to face that summer, he was wonderful. He said to me, hey, I'm sorry I sounded a bit abrupt on the phone. I just wanted to make sure that it was really clear to you what Jesus has done on the cross and why we stand before God responsible for our rebellion and the price is paid and it's a gift and you're right with God. And he knew I'd understood it. And he said, I'm so thrilled. He said, do you mind if I give you one piece of advice? Only one. I said, no, go ahead. He said, it's more important that you're more excited about Jesus in 10 years time than you are today. He said, always walk around saying to yourself, 10 years time, 10 years time. Sometimes it's 10 weeks time. Sometimes it's 10 hours time. When temptation comes your way and you go in 10 minutes time, I want to be excited that I know Christ. So I'm fighting it. I'm going to fight for 10 minutes or 10 hours or 10 weeks. Or I'm going to fight to hold on to Christ and to trust Christ. So um, if you do give your life to Christ in any time soon, keep looking forward and saying, I want to be more excited and keep believing. He really does love you. I mean, he really does love you. I preach that to myself all the time, Kaz, all the time, because I'm so frail. Uh, and that's the wonder of having a savior, isn't it? Life becomes rich despite your own fragility. My goodness me. Absolutely. Dan, I thank you so much. Really appreciate your time, your honesty, and um, all those stories just help it kind of, yeah, makes a lot of sense. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And, um, Absolute privilege. We'll privilege talking too. to you. Privilege talking to you. And I, I haven't been to Grace Church for a while, but... I'm not, I'm not blagging you, Kaz. One of my favorite <laughs> churches anywhere, because I know what you stand for. And anyone who listens to the broadcasts, as it were, or podcasts or vodcasts or vlogcasts or services, <laughs> anyone who listens to anything coming from the church will get a good, clear understanding of the gospel and the feel of what Christianity is like to live out, not just thoughts, but lifestyle. So it's a joy to be on this with you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Love to the family. Thank See you, you soon. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Graham and Kaz, for sharing with us this evening. There's a lot to make us think there, isn't there? There's also a lot to inspire us, isn't there? Uh, it's so helpful to hear how God works in all kinds of places and how the Christian gospel roots us and, and helps us 
in, in our lives, whatever uh, our situation and stage in life. Uh, I want to pray very much for the things that Dan has been talking about this evening. So would you join with me as we come towards the end of our meeting? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Dano. We thank you for his uh, knowledge of you and his willingness to share his faith. Thank you for his work with Christians in Sport and how you are using him and very many others to reach people that otherwise would be difficult to reach. We do commit you that support for elite sports people and all the people they meet. Some of them are global names and they would meet people hard to reach otherwise. We commit them to you. Most of us, Lord, we're just down, as it were, down at street level, but we mix with people who we love very much. Some of us formerly in a sports club, others of us just neighbours and friends. We pray that we might have that heart for the gospel that we've been hearing about this evening. We pray that we would be rooted and grounded in Christ ourselves so that we live lives of integrity, lives that commend uh, Jesus to others and give us that ability and opportunity to speak naturally for him when those opportunities come. We do commit Graham's work to you, uh, uh, also in the sport he loves in football. We know that many clubs, including his beloved Cambridge United, are going through tough times at the moment when people can't come and pay to see. And it's hard for sports clubs all around the country. We commit him and Cambridge United and other sports clubs to you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for uh, that witness to Christ around our nation, that Covid won't cause us to be awaiting for opportunity to come in years to come. Help us to seek you for ourselves, that we might know you at work through our lives right now. We thank you for what we've heard tonight. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus above everything. And we commend ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you found it helpful. If you are a sports person, you didn't know much about Christians in Sport, do visit their website or talk to Kaz. She can tell you a lot more about it. If you're not a sports person, I do hope and pray that you might be able to pass this on to others, those who perhaps in your family who are, or you yourself will pass it on to others who are perhaps discouraged and need to hear something inspirational. Thanks for tuning in this evening. And may God richly bless you in this coming week. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.